was about three when my love affair with wildlife started. I was obsessed with the book on birds of paradise which my grandfather had gifted. I grew up watching these beautiful wildlife documentaries. Cuddly polar bears emerging from the dens for the first time. Tiger cubs play fighting in the Indian jungles and kangaroos hopping about. Growing up in my New Delhi apartment, these books and films were my window to the natural world. But I grew up in a bubble. I decided to be a conservation filmmaker because I did not want to be in the bubble anymore. I did not want to lie to others and say everything is okay. The polar ice caps are melting, tigers are running out of space, wildfires are claiming lives everywhere, and rainforests are getting cleared out to feed the ever-growing human consumption at a rate at which we could see them vanish altogether in my lifetime. Home of my birds of paradise. With the sixth mass extinction, the first human-induced mass extinction of species, we have to change the way we make films. We have to tell the truth. Truth that can inspire a call to action. Make a difference because all hope is not lost. Four years ago, I read an article which showed the devastating effects of habitat loss and climate change on the red panda population. Scientists estimated that there could be fewer than 2,500 left. My favorite, beautiful, funny little animals were dying for no fault of theirs. And I had to do something about it. I went around telling everyone that I wanted to film them in the wild. I was pursuing my master's at the time in Bristol and my professors were confused as to why I'd even attempt something so challenging when I was so inexperienced. The chances of finding a red panda, let alone filming one in the wild, were very, very slim. But I was determined. Now in case you're wondering too, many of my friends had never heard of red pandas. One was even cheeky enough to say, I don't know, pandas came in red. That's when I realized how was I going to help save a species which people hadn't even heard of. I knew I had to take my conservation message to the masses. Preaching to the choir wasn't going to help anymore. I then found Minuka, a fearless young woman in a remote forest in Nepal, working against society to save red pandas. And she became the heart of my film. We told the story of red pandas through the eyes of the local community. And almost magically, people who didn't care about pandas or the forests in Nepal were drawn in because they cared about my human character. It became about ecofeminism, about the role of local communities in red panda conservation, and about love. <laughs> So I learned that to make people care, telling the truth was not enough. They also had to fall in love. With either of those elements missing, my plan wouldn't work. Only love, you stay in a bubble like me. Only conservation truth, well, no one watches. So we had nailed two elements of how conservation storytelling can work. So I took it one step further by including an impact strategy in my films. What if my stories could actually help inspire someone the same way I was drawn to conservation? What if it could be truly instrumental in the conservation of a species? We took our film to over 500 school and college students and raised funds for red pandas in the wild. The film was critically acclaimed at over 30 festivals across 15 countries. But what really touched me was when this little girl from Oregon sent me an email. Six-year-old Emmy wrote to me and said she now wants to become a conservationist like Menuka to save red pandas. This photo was sent to Menuka in Nepal, where she was overwhelmed by how her story could inspire a little girl across the seas. 
Last year, we were shooting a story on Olive Ridley turtles. We were to film eggs hatching and babies making their way to the ocean. Supposed to be a one-day shoot, but it took us a whole week. Because the eggs weren't hatching. First time in 20 years in the life of the conservationist working there, the turtles did not hatch on time. Because climate change had delayed their cycle. Sea turtles face another threat from climate change. The temperature during the development of the embryo determines whether a male or female turtle hatches. Higher temperature results in females and lower in males. Increasing sand temperatures on nesting beaches can hence shift the sex ratio of hatchlings to almost entirely female, messing with their future reproduction. So we brought this story to the people and packaged it like a story of hope with baby hatchlings. This way, people actually listened to a climate change story and we reached lakhs of people within 24 hours. So effective science communication plays a crucial role in fighting the climate crisis. I told you earlier that I grew up in New Delhi. I've seen sparrows disappearing right in front of my eyes. I've seen the pollution rise, the summers getting hotter, and the winters shorter. Last Christmas, my friend's kids weren't allowed to go out and play because at the age of five, her son got diagnosed with severe asthma. Is this the future we imagined? I wasn't going to keep quiet about it. I joined hands with a climate activist in the city and we put out this call to action video with a very simple idea and message. Nothing fancy, no big budgets, just my DSLR and my friend in a chair. But it did the trick. This video made people uncomfortable but ignited a passion to act and change things. It had a clear call to action to question and make our policy makers accountable. Working closely with indigenous communities, I've observed that our understanding of the natural world is very limited compared to their traditional experiences with the forest. For us, it's about acting like a savior to protect nature. For them, it's a way of life. Their livelihood depends on the well-being of nature. If we can include them in our plans of sustainable development, work with them, use what they already know, we will surely come up with better solutions. <laughs> I love when my friends say we need to save nature. Oh darling, nature will be just fine. It will bounce back. We need to let nature be to save ourselves. Today we celebrate a rise in tiger numbers but ignore what's being done to their habitat. They have a very species-focused view of conservation but if you take a step back and look at the whole picture, you protect the habitat, the species will thrive. It's as simple as that and that's what we need to push for. The climate crisis we're in demands a lot more from you and me if we have to reverse it. There are solutions, but our role from here on is to convince the others. I love this quote by Anne-Marie Bonhomme. She says, we don't need a handful of people doing zero waste perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. You do what works best for you. I use my skills as a communicator and filmmaker to spread these ideas. You might be a great artist, an engineer, a parent. You all have a role to play. I dream of a world where climate change is not a problem. I can go back to filming pretty landscapes and animal behavior. No kidding, I would love that. But what I'm not ready to do is to have to explain to my children why I didn't do anything and why my little girl has to settle for only a photograph of a red panda. I still haven't been able to film birds of paradise yet. But every day, I dream of the day I can finally go see them. And I hope that when I do, 
they're still there.